Well, I think the, the lessons we should have learned is that uh, the Arab world is not Eastern Europe. When the wall came down in Eastern Europe and nations reverted to the place they were before the Soviet occupation with established governments and a return to democracy, that's not the Arab world. The tragedy of the Arab world is once the established regimes collapsed, they were replaced by either radical Islamist groups or by chaos in which the chaos spread in a sectarian manner, often tribal ways, ethnic breakups. Uh, we've seen the area come apart. So what lessons do you learn from that? And that is, I think it's simply impossible in a chaotic revolutionary situation like the region to make your way forward to establish American policies for our, our policies have been upended in this period without recognizing the importance of re-establishing stability as a core concept of the direction of your policy. Uh, it doesn't mean it has to be a reversion to the old order, but you need to create stability in countries and for that to occur, you need to recreate stability in the international system that surrounds the region. For what have we seen? We've seen Turkey, Iran fly apart, Saudi Arabia, Iran fly apart. The great powers come apart, Russia and the United States backing different horses. With that going on, we are each in our own ways exacerbating the new tensions in the region. So stability is about reestablishing an understanding among the external powers that the discord inside Arab nations today is none of our interests. And we have to come up with political solutions that address those interests. Otherwise, it's a devil's playground and you'll have ISIS. You had Al-Qaeda yesterday, you'll have an ISIS today, and tomorrow you'll have some other dreadful phenomena. So two points to repeat. You need to aim for stable regimes in the region on which you can build democracy in the future. You need a stable regional political structure. I think I would like you to start the analysis by reflecting on who we are. Uh, because I think there's a terrible habit in this country to assume there are solutions that, quote, American leadership can bring to the table and solve problems. The Middle East is not about solving problems. You're not going to get there. And it's not about American leadership. It's about your capacity to articulate a vision and bring together coalitions inside the region uh, aimed at common objectives. That means we have to be active, but we are wrong to put ourselves, quote unquote, in a leadership position because no one else is going to want to follow. They're all going to want to make sure their interests are protected. So if you ask me, the critical tool is a direction, and that is restoration of a balance of power in the region between the major contenders in the area so that you can begin to reestablish stability internally in Arab lands and get on a path that is sustainable. Be very careful, 11 million probably understates the real problem, because you're talking principally about Syria. But what about Iraq? What about the people who were displaced in the previous Iraq wars? What about now, 50 years ago, million plus Palestinians who are still in refugee status. This is the region of the world riven <coughs> with the refugee problem. I think there are many ways this has to be dealt with. The first way is seeking political solutions to the problems that create the refugees. Uh, if you don't do that, then you'll continue to generate future flows. That's one aspect. The second aspect is to 
deal with the question of care for people who have been displaced internally or across borders. <clears throat> and that means generous allocations of assistance for refugee relief. And I can assure you the international community, including the United States, has fallen well short of our responsibilities in this regard. The UNHCR, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, and other institutions are seriously underfunded in the simple task of managing refugees while they're in this suspended state. But the third issue is migration. There is absolutely no doubt in any of our minds that a significant or a portion of the refugees from and inside the region are going to make their way outside the region. Whether it's to Europe or beyond, they're on the move right now, posing unbelievable uh, difficulties <coughs> for Europe and our alliance partners in that continent. Um, here, I think the United States has a real role to play. It has a political role, it has a relief role, but it also has a resettlement responsibility. The United States is a nation of immigrants. <clears throat> we have accepted refugees in this country in large numbers throughout our history. Irish refugees from famine, German refugees from 1848, refugees in the tumultuous period leading after World War I, the displaced persons after World War II, a million Indo-Chinese refugees. This nation has grown strong on the basis of people coming from abroad seeking freedom, prosperity inside our shores and enriching the American mainstream. Now, I think again in the Syria case, we are under, underperforming an historic responsibility we are a nation that could take 100,000 Syrians or 200,000 Syrians if we got our mind set on the fact that that is our responsibility. It's a responsibility of moral dimensions and it's a responsibility of political importance and it works for America. We are always stronger by our ability to include those who make their way to this country, often well-educated, productive people, but who are keen to be good Americans. That's the record in the past. It can be again, and we ought to open our doors. It is. Migration issues have to be managed right. separately. We're talking about refugees, people who are driven out of their homes right. by violence and are reasonably classified as fleeing for their lives. we have lost the lead and we have found ourselves yeah. outpaced by the Russians. Um, we ought to be designing the political package for Syria, not waiting for Russia to create facts on the ground. Now, <clears throat> what is that outcome that you have to have? I think all of us ought to recognize that Syria is not going to be settled militarily. And I can assure you the Russians know that. The Iranians know that. Assad knows that. ISIS, I don't know what they know, but they better know that. You need a political settlement. Now that means you've got to get an agreement between the external parties who are playing inside the Syrian equation and among Syrians themselves. The best way to defeat ISIS, and that to me is the principal responsibility or priority that we ought to establish and to establish once again a sovereign Syrian state with its territorial integrity restored is to create a political transition from the regime that exists today to a through a transitional period to a regime in the future in which Assad goes at some point he goes from this and bring that coalition of the majority of Syrians together to build a new state on the one hand and the other to combat the religious radicals, ISIS and Jabhat Nusra and the other self-proclaimed Islamic uh, <clears throat> fundamentalists. So 
That's the direction you need to set for yourself to come up with a political solution that restores Syria, creates an international coalition in its favor, and then gets down to designing the package itself. That's where I want to see us. Assad and his regime, as despicable as they are, it is the government, and we want that government to be transferred to responsible hands. You can't pull it apart and then reconstitute it as if it was some kind of instant coffee. You need to have a structure in place. Therefore, when the Russians come in, the Iranians come in and bolster a declining regime, it's not to win the war, but it's to create the conditions in which there will be a structural element in something better us if the diplomacy is put into gear and if it shapes the kind of conclusion I've tried to outline. I'm reasonably optimistic, I'm actually quite confident that the relationship is now on an irreversible course because our interests and Indian interests are finally aligned. We want a strong India. It's good for us, it's good for our markets and our economy, and it's good for the balance of power in Asia. And vice versa, the Indians want a strong America. They want us playing a positive and robust role in Asia, and they want our markets open for their goods and services, and they want a flow of technology. And over the years, as you know, there are better than a million Americans of Indian origin, probably the richest immigrant community in this country, and hugely productive. So we're in a interesting kind of unofficial partnership, common objectives. And I think that's sustainable. The question is how can it, what shape can it take in the future? And I'm reasonably optimistic again. A lot will depend on what India does. We can't make India a strong country. India's got to make herself a strong country. But if India decides to enter the world trading system, we can help India get there to become a member of APEC and one day TPP and be a world-class economy capable of competing on any international marketplace, growing jobs and services and profiting from the expanded trade picture that we have in front of us. We can help strengthen India's security and economic and military potential with technology transfers, military exercises, intelligence exchanges, all of those things happen. India at the same time is a very important factor in maintaining that Asian balance so that China doesn't look at Asia as a series of nations that have to stand on their knees to respect Chinese power, but have their own sovereign interests to stand by. And our friends of the United States, that you keep, keep the Asian world in balance, not with the dominant and subordinate players, which is an Asia we'll be comfortable with. So India can play all of those roles and the relationship can. I'm optimistic about it, but I'm also highly sensitive to all the difficulties of getting there. Uh, India is a big, fractious democracy. Elections take place virtually every year. Uh, prime ministerial elections take place in the four-year cycles. But you end up with a country that is intensely politicized. Mm -hmm. And getting decisions in India is incremental. It's not strategic, um, and those things that we want to have happen don't happen immediately because politics play their part. But then, if there's a country that ought to understand that imperative, it's the United States. The difference that I think we now have a stable relationship on the nuclear front with India, where we could not have any relationship until we got the nuclear issue settled. It would have always upset our ability to cooperate with India. Now, why can we have a stable relationship? Basically, because we can trust India. 
her record of nuclear responsibility <laughs> is extremely clear. In addition, she's undertaken to act within global norms for the export and management of the trade in nuclear items. Yes. She's joined the international understand wants to join more and we it's in our interest to make sure she gets inside of international arrangements that manage nuclear trade missiles and issues that can destabilize the defense front so I think we have a real partner in India what has proved difficult is one serious issue and that is managing liability in the construction of nuclear power plants and that's proved to be devilishly complicated. Right, right. I think we're going to find some way to settle it and begin to see the development of, of nuclear power stations in India. Uh, very important for India's needs. She suffers from terrible the scourge of pollution of the atmosphere, needs to lower the co carbon emissions in the country. Um, and other countries are playing. We need to play. Uh, it'll be in our interest to make sure we get there. I think that's an issue will be settled. But there is nuclear peace, if you will, between the United States and India. And that's what's the core accomplishment of the 2005 agreement. Okay. As I look back in history, I felt at the time, the early 90s, that they, we were going to have to phase out of the bases, right. but that I wanted to have a smooth transition to a post-base security relationship with the Philippines based on the core treaties that bound the United States and the Philippines and still exist today. I think it was not quite possible to go from the past to the future in a smooth manner. You really had to end the old relationship. Philippine politics were simply too roiled by the presence of Americans in fixed installations in the Philippines. And until we withdrew, you couldn't begin to reimagine and reconfigure a relationship. And I have many memories of yeah. debates, discussions with Filipinos. But now the facts have continued. China's rise, the power of China's rise, China's reach China's assertion of a nine-line nine claim in the South China Sea has confronted the Philippines with the fact that she needs a great power security friend. And she has a treaty relationship, a long-range experience with the United States. So it is quite natural that both diplomatically and in security terms, the Filipinos have reached out to us and we have found common ground because our best interests are served by a series of nations from Korea, Japan, through the Philippines, Indonesia, all the way to India, to have a ring, if you will, not to contain China, but to balance Chinese power, add to it the ingredient of American power and you create conditions of stability through balance. So here the Philippines become a part again of a deeper logic. And I think there's real prospects for a continuing both political and security relationship with the Philippines. I, mean, I have to admit to a bit of a personal hobby horse, I wish I could take this word leadership out yeah. and replace it with influence. Yeah. Because leadership, the assertion of American leadership, implies a dominance. It implies someone's at the head of the line and everybody else is falling in behind. And there are a lot of countries in this world who don't think they want to be led, mm. but that they would be prepared to deal with the influence of the United States, provided that we are able to sustain our national power, our economic power, our military power, that's a different kettle of fish. I do not share the declinist view of the United States. I think we have an extraordinary economy and we're going to see this economy rip forth in the decade ahead with major new infusions of technology 
and our extraordinarily flexible system of mobilizing capital. Uh, it's going to be another challenge for us to deal with the equity issue, for I do believe there isn't growth in our economy without equity, and there isn't equity without growth. You've got to have the two. So those are going to be challenges for America, but we're going to meet those challenges better than virtually anyone in the world today. Now, I think we have a good future ahead of us, but in order to have influence in the world, we have to play our cards smartly. Intervene, have strat with a strategic intention in mind. Think through what we want to accomplish. Deal with the totality of problems rather than pick them loose. Adopt real policies, not attitudes. Get yourself involved in major game-changing international undertakings. The trade agreements, TTIP and T TPP are good examples to deal with the climate change issue and reach a strong agreement in Paris, another area to help um, take our rightful place and encourage others to do what needs to be done by in the field of transnational migration. All of these are issues the United States can play a role in. The United States can play a role in convening uh, to deal with cyber questions as we get deeper into this new age of uh, information technology, cyber technology. So there are a huge array of subjects the United States needs to act on and to influence an international consensus. Not to drive it, we don't drive, we don't do it bayonet points, but our strength will be derivative of our economic and military power, which people will recognize as uniquely American. So I'm an American optimist, not a declinist. Well, there are a variety, and to think that there's one and you can ignore the others is, of course, a fool's paradise. The, they're, they're the, the, the great transnational issues that we have to wrestle with, um, climate change being a classic transnational issue, and many others that we've mentioned before. But I think inherent in the management of the international system is the question of power and how power is dealt with. National power and the management of national power. We need to have a concept that permits the United States to look at the world as a set of balances in which each nation's interests, particularly the great nations, the Chinas, Europe's, the Russia's, the Japan's, ourselves, are taken into account to make certain that you've got a balance between those interests and no threat to security. Uh, if you start there, then I think the most delicate issue, specific issue, is our relationship to the People's Republic of China and how we accommodate ourselves to the rise of Chinese power because China is rising economically, <clears throat> security terms, political terms in its Asian area at the moment, but on the global stage in time to come. How we associate ourselves with a nation whose impulses are very different than ours. How do we deal with, how do we draw red lines? How do we manage this very delicate but extremely powerful phenomena that is today's China and do it respectfully but at the same time firmly? <laughs>